Hello everyone, welcome to Mammoth Interactive's introduction to input in Unity. What we want to achieve in this video is to make a very simple use of input system. So we can listen for key presses to make this cube to look to the left, to the right, and also to move forward. And we're going to press the space button to make this cube to move up, okay, to basically jump. And also, something that is used on several games is a system with multiple cameras. So if you click with the mouse button, you're able to see the cube from different points of view. Okay, you can look from uh, forward, from the left, you can look from the top, and you can also look in a camera that chases the player. Okay, so these are real life scenarios, and you're going to use this a lot in different games. Again, commercial games that you see on stores, and also on virtual reality games. It's going to be very useful. My name is Glauco Pires and I've been working in the game industry since 2010. So throughout the years I've worked with several engines and programming languages. So I've worked with Unity, Unreal, I've made Flash games, I work with HTML5 games as well, and I work with C Sharp, Java. So I have a lot of experience uh, that I acquired in these years and I would like to share this experience with you in order for you to learn how to do these simple uh, interactions here in the best and simplest way possible. Okay, so if you don't have Unity yet, you can just go to the unity3d.com webpage, download the personal version, okay, it's free, there's no need to pay for anything, and after that, in the next video, we're going to learn how to make a new video and start working on input, okay, what is input, why it's, it is important to use it, and how can we access it. So I hope you're excited to start this, and I see you soon. Hello there! With Unity Open, we have to create a new project so we can learn more about what is input and how we can use it in this software. So, first of all, we click on the new button in the top right. The project name is going to be Unity Input, and the location is going to be just a projects folder under my home folder, and I'm going to leave 3D enabled. After that, we just have to press Create Project and wait for a little bit. Okay? So, in general, when you're developing software, you have to listen for input all the time. Otherwise, you would just watch a movie. So the user has to interact with the software. Okay. So if you have a software that is going to control the access of personnel to a certain company, uh, the player is expected, to, the user is expected to give input to a certain machine. So, for example, if I start to work, I have to use my personal a company card to have access, or use my fingerprint, or maybe uh, show my eye for a retina scanner. Still, all of these, they are different types of input. And input is very heavy on games because uh, they rely on interaction. Okay, so for example, if you're playing a platformer game, you have a player, okay, and the player is going to stand still unless you do something. Of course, there are some games that are different, but let's think of platformers in general. If you want to make a player to move, you have to press the right key, okay, if you are on a computer, or if you are on a, uh, a console, like Xbox or PlayStation, for example, you have to use uh, the shifter to and then move to the right, okay, the dialog, the analog stick to make you move to the right. If you want to make the player to jump, you have to press the space bar, or you have to press the A button, and then uh, you're gonna have to click to fire, and in more complex games, okay, in, in, in first-person shooters or third-person shooters, you have lots and lots of controls. Sometimes it feels like a gamepad with uh, nearly 15, 20 buttons is not enough, okay, there are different types of things that we can do. So it is important to learn how to do these things in Unity, okay? So you should watch this video after you've learned a bit about code, but still we're going to, to learn this in a, a nice steady pace, okay? So first of all, as we want to do some tests, we need to create a game object. We need to create an entity that is going to be sitting here in our scene. It's not going to be visual, it's not going to be a 3D asset, but we're going to use it so we can test some things, okay? So in the hierarchy, we're going to right click and I'm going to choose create empty and this new game object we want to rename it to game controller. We want to set its position to 0, 0, 0 so it's going to be in the center of the world and now we need to create a script for it okay? because we're going to write some custom behavior then we need to write our own script. So we go to the project window in the assets folder we're going to right click, select create and then C sharp script. 
and we're going to name this game controller. Okay, and after we hit enter, we have to wait just a little bit for this script to be compiled and to be ready uh, for use. Okay, now we double click the game controller file, and Mono Develop is going to open, which is a free so a free software. It's open source. It's great for coding and already comes with Unity. Okay, and after the software open, we already have some lines in here. Okay, so in general, we just have the definition for the game controller in here. Whatever we put here is going to change how the game controller is going to behave. And we also have some methods. Okay, and these are going to be essential for us to test for input. Okay, methods are called whenever you want some operations to be executed. It's like you make a recipe for baking a cake or a pizza, for example. So when you call the method bake cake, you're going to follow all of the steps to make that cake. Okay. So we have the start method, which is called whenever this script is ready to be used. So that means the game controller has been loaded. And we also have the update method, which is called every frame. So every time the game is processed, and that happens dozens of times each second, then the update method is called. Okay. And for this script to be executed, it needs to be attached somewhere. So we have to go to Unity. We have to select our game controller, and we need to drag our game controller script to the game controller game object. Okay, we drag and drop, and once we drop, we have the game controller component. So this ensures that this script is going to be executed. Okay, so what we want to do here is we want to print a simple message. Okay, we are going to the start method in the game controller, and we're going to type debug.log hello world. So what are we doing here? We are accessing the class debug, that's basically for a developer uh, some developer methods and properties that can be used. We use the dot operation to access something that belongs to the debug class and we call the log method. We're going to call an operation. And we open and close parentheses because this is a method call and we pass exactly one parameter. In this case it is the string or the text hello world. We just want to print that. That's pretty much uh, the, the main lesson when you're learning any programming language is just print this text hello world. Okay, and once we're back to Unity, okay, also let's make sure that we save the script. Now we're back to Unity, we wait for this compilation to be completed, and after it is done, we're going to press the play button. Okay, and once this happens, we have to wait just a little bit for the compilation to complete, and then we have the message in the console, hello world. If you can't see the console, you can enable it by just going to window and select console. Okay, so we've printed this message. That means that we already have access to the script, it's been properly executed, so we can test a few things. Now, the input methods, they need to be checked every time. Okay, we need to, to put them in the update method. And why is that? Uh, for example, let's say you press play and then your game is running. At that moment, no keys are being pressed. Okay, but if a key is pressed, we are going to do something like printing a message, like uh, pressed right, for example. Okay. Uh, however, uh, there are two ways to do this. Okay. In other programming languages and other APIs, for example, you can listen for events, for the event of a key press. And each key press contains its own method. But there is another way we can do this in Unity that makes more sense and makes the code to be a bit tidier. Okay. So in the update method, we need to check if some key is being pressed. We're going to check for a space now. So to do this, we need a conditional block. So we're going to type if, open and close parenthesis, and open and close curly braces. The if block is a block where we ask a question. Okay, so we're going to ask something here, like if 1 plus 1 equals to 2. So if this is true, which it is in this case, we're going to execute whatever operations we put between these curly braces. Okay, so inside this scope. But if whatever we put here is false, like uh, 0 equals to 5, for example. If this is false, what we put here is not going to be executed. However, what we want to put here is we want to check if the space has been pressed. To do this, we're going to type input. Okay, so input is the class that is basically the interface for the input system, like you can see in the summary. So input dot get key, right, we're going to open and close parenthesis, and between parenthesis, we're going to pass the string space. Okay, so getKey is a method that receives the name of the key that wants to be used, 
And this is going to return a Boolean value, as you can see here in this tooltip. A Boolean variable is basically true or false. Okay, so this method call is the question itself that we're putting in this uh, conditional block. Okay, so if space is being pressed, this is going to return true, then we're going to print something. If this is false, this is going to, well, it's going to evaluate as false, then nothing is going to happen. So when get key space is true, we're going to print debug.log and between parentheses we're going to pass a string uh, jump. Okay, so we're going to save this. Now we move back to Unity and wait for this compilation to be done. After this, let's just clear the console to make sure everything is going to be okay. I'm going to press the play button, so the game is live now, we have the hello world printed, and if I press the space key, jump is being printed. Okay, but there is something interesting happening here. Notice that my console contains the collapse uh, box enabled. Okay, that means that if multiple messages, multiple identical messages are being printed one right after the other, they're going to be collapsed, they're going to be uh, joined. Okay, so we see only one jump message here, but it has been called 50 times. Okay, the problem is if I press space and I hold it down, it's going to be printing all the time. Okay, so 100 times, 200 times, 300 times, the event is happening all the time. But if I release it, then it stops printing. Okay, so we stopped at 500 times. This is not what's supposed to happen when you want to make a player jump. Okay, so if you press the space button, you want the player to jump or, in, for example, to fire a bullet, for example. However, you just want to jump again if you release the space button and you press the space button again. You can only shoot uh, with, with a shotgun, for example, once, then you have to release the key and press it again to shoot. And that applies for shooting grenades and shooting rockets if you are on a space game, okay, if you are, uh, if you want to enter a car, then that's the same thing, you just have to press the button once, okay, so this works different. So to do this, to make this jump to work as a, a trigger key, it's what we commonly call, instead of using get key, we use get key down. Okay, and here's the thing. Uh, if you look at the summary, it's going to say returns true during the frame the user starts pressing down the key identified by the name. Okay, so there's an inter interesting concept here. Remember, the update method is called once per frame. Your game is being processed all the time. So if you, I don't know, if the app is open for 10 seconds, then it has been processed uh, uh, like 600 times. It's always doing calculations, always listening for input putting things on the screen, okay, lots of operations are going on. And they do in these little chunks of time, in little frames. So an app that is going to run uh, very smoothly runs at 60 frames per second. Okay, so update happens 60 times a second. And get key down is going to return true only in the exact frame that the key has been pressed. So we are in the update method, even though it's happening all the time. If we press the space button, get key down returns true only once. It then switches back to false and you have to release the space key and press it again so get key down is going to return true. So now let's save this, go to Unity and again wait for a compilation. We're going to press the play button and now if I press space notice that jump has been printed only once. I'm going to release space key, press it again, two, three, four then get key down is working as a trigger method. Okay, it's printing one right after the other. We can even disable the collapse and try like this. Okay, so it's working properly. All right, so this is how it's worked for the space button, but if you want to move to the left or to the right, we want to use the get key method. So let's make some prints for that. We're going to type here if input.getKey and between parentheses the string left. We close the parentheses properly, we open and close curly braces, then we're going to put here debug.log move left. We do the same thing for the right key. If input.get key and between parentheses right, then we're going to print debug.log and between parentheses move right. Okay, now we save this and also let me just adjust this here. Okay, I just missed the double quote. We're going to save this, wait for the compilation to complete. And now that it is done, we can press the play button. So there we go, we have the hello world message. We can 
trigger the jump events, one right after the other. If we hold the left key, move left is going to be printed all the time, which is expected because we do that for movement. And if we hold the right key, move right is being printed, okay, like this, which is expected. So now that we have these things done, let's save our scene just so we don't miss the game controller. We go to File, Save Scene. We're going to name this Game.Unity, so the scene is saved. And in the next video, let's work on making a very small cube to move. Now that we want to make a cube to move, we need to create a visual primitive here. So we're going to the hierarchy, we're going to right click, 3D object, and then cube. Okay, so a cube has been added to our scene. It's very simple, very a very simple 3D mesh. Let's rename this cube to player, and we're going to change the player's position to be zero, zero, zero. Okay, so it's going to be standing in this position. And better than this, let's change y to zero dot five. So it's going to be standing a bit over the floor. Okay, and if we want to change the color of the player, we need to create a new material. So we go to the assets panel, right click create material and we want to change that to player material. Now in the inspector we're going to change the color of this material to something different like yellow for example, something that's going to be very easy to spot and we're going to drag and drop the material inside the player in the scene. Okay, And now we need to create a script for the player just like we did with the game controller. So we right click, select create, then C sharp script and we're going to name this player. Now we just have to wait for the compilation to complete and once it is done we just double click the player to open the script. Okay, and remember, this is very important, this script needs to be attached to the player. So we're going to drag the player script file and drop in the player game object. Okay, And if you take a look at the inspector we now have the player script component in here. So we can start making a logic for this player to move. Okay, so let's put in action what we learned by using the game controller. Okay, we're not going to use this input calls in here. Okay, let's it was just for testing. I'm going to leave uh, hello world here, and in the player we want to make it move uh, to the left and to the right to either of these directions. Okay, so we want to test the movement to the right. So we're going to type if input dot get key. Remember, it's just getting get key because we want to process when we are holding down a key. And the parameter is going to be right. Okay? So input.getKey right. Now, how do we make the player to move? If you look at the player game object, in any game object that you have in this scene in general, you have a list of components in this game object. In the case of the player, we have the cube, which is mesh filter, which is the 3D data. We have the box collider, which is used, as the name suggests, for collisions. We have the mesh render, which is used for drawing the cube. Okay, if you don't have this, you can see no cube at all. And we have the player component. But we have the transform component, and this is the most important of them, because it deals with the position, the rotation, and scale of the player. So right now, we have the player in the position 0. But if we want to make the player move horizontally, we have to change this value in the x axis. Okay, We can change it to a negative number if we move to the left, or to a positive number if we move to the right. And the important thing here is, the position is a property that contains three values. Okay, And, and this collection of these three values is a vector 3. Okay, It's a collection of the position in the horizontal axis, in the vertical axis, and in the depth axis, in all of these three. So to make the player to move to the right, we need to do a few things. First of all, we need to create a variable for this player to define the moving speed. So in the top of the class definition, we type public float speed equals to something like um, 3.5f. Okay. So what I just did was declare a variable. The variable name is going to store something. Okay. So the name is speed. The variable is going to store a floating point number. This variable is public, so it can be accessed in other classes and in the Unity Editor. And we already start by assigning the value 3.5. Okay, that's 3.5f. 3.5. And a semicolon to finish this statement. And for the update, this is what we have to do. We're going to type transform.position 
plus equals. And some people might think we just have to type speed here. Okay, if you try to jump ahead and you say that transform position plus equals speed, that is going to increase our position in the right axis. But if you go to Unity, you're going to see that there is an error. It says the operation plus equals cannot be applied to operands of type vector3 and float. Okay, so why is this happening? When we type transform here, we are accessing the transform component of the player game object. Okay, so imagine you are here in the script, you press the right button and then it says transform. Okay, so you jump to this component here. And when you type dot position, you access the position property inside the transform component. Okay, so when you type transform dot position, you access this here. This property can be read or modified. If you just want to read the values, you can, but if you want to change these values, you also can. When we type plus equals, it means we're going to increase this. We're going to sum whatever we have here to something else, and the result is going to be stored here. So for example, if let me just make a very quick uh, example here. Imagine the position of the player is 10, 5, uh, 0. When we type transform.position plus equals to another vector like uh, 200, zero, zero, that means that this, these two vectors need to, to sum. Okay, so we're going to sum the x values, the y values, and the z values. So the result of this sum is going to be 12, 5, 0. Okay, and this result that we have here is going to be stored in the transform.position. That's pretty much what we're doing here. However, the important thing that you have to realize this is that this sum is uh, executed with things of the same type. Okay? Position is a vector 3, but speed is a floating point number. Okay? So you might be asking now, okay, why do we have then this speed variable? Okay? Because of this, we're going to type here vector 3 dot write multiplied by speed. Okay. Now, position is a vector 3, and vector 3 dot write is a vector 3 as well. Okay. And as you can see in the summary, this is a shorthand for writing vector 3, 1, 0, 0. So it's just 1 in the horizontal axis. And while both of these values are vector 3s, this one is a point. Okay, it's a position. And this one is a direction. Okay, so that is a vector. Imagine that is an arrow that contains a size of 1. And 1 is a great number when you're developing games, because if you multiply 1 by anything, the resulting operation is still that 1. So if we have vector 3 dot right and we multiply it by speed, that means we're increasing the size of this arrow to make the player move faster. Okay? So that is enough for making the player move, but there is one more detail. This operation is being executed inside the update method. So different devices, okay, so devices that have a faster processor or a device that contains a slower processor are going to call the update method different times each second. Okay, so a quick one might call update 60 times each second and a slow one might call the update method just 10 times each second or just 5 times each second. Okay? which is not good. So that means that uh, players with a faster device would have a better uh, match, a better experience, which is not very fair. Okay, so we need to make sure that we try to make all experiences all, uh, as similar as possible. So to do this, we're going to multiply all of this by time dot delta time. Okay, and when we do this, it means uh, if you are running on a fast device, time dot delta time is going to return how many seconds have passed since the last frame. So this is going to be a, 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 a small number. Okay, so the update method is called more times in a faster smartphone, for example, but the player is going to move shorter distances on each of these calls. Okay, in a way that a slow device is going to, to move longer distances, even though the update method is called lesser times, but in the end, the result of all this discussion is that they're both going to, to travel the same distance over time. Okay, so now if we save this and we go to Unity, let's wait for this compilation to complete, this error is completely disappeared, okay, and if we press the play button, there we go, if we press the right arrow, then the player is moving to the right, okay, which is exactly what we want, okay, we can already give input for this player. And notice that you can change the speed variable without having to recompile the code. So if I put speed as 1 here in the editor and I press play, the player is moving much uh, slower than before. 
Okay, and even at runtime, I can change that to other values. Okay, like two, uh, maybe four. Right, we can just find whatever is going to be fine. I think three dot five was fine in the beginning. Okay, and now let's make the cube move to the left. Now we put if input dot get key, and we type in left. Okay, between parentheses, as this is a parameter of the get key call, we open and close curly braces. Then we're going to do the exact same thing here. Okay, there are two ways we can do this. One way is to get exactly what we added here. Okay, transform dot position, uh, vector three dot right multiplied by speed multiplied by time dot delta time. But instead of using plus equals, we can type minus equals. So we're going to decrease. Okay, if we save this and go to Unity and wait for this compilation to be finished. We can press the play button, and since the direction is now the opposite of right, it's going to be left. So if you press the left button, the player moves to the left, and right to the right. However, I think it's better not, not, to not just change signs. Okay, we can use plus equals here, and instead of vector 3 dot right, we use vector 3 dot left. Okay, it's going to achieve the exact same effect. If you save this, go to Unity, wait for the compilation, and press play, then the player is going to move to the right and to the left just as it was before, okay, in the exact uh, same way. So now that we did the movement to the left and to the right, let's take the moment to save the scene, and in the next video we're going to make the player to be able to jump, so we're going to apply some physics to it. See you soon!